Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, where we're going to discuss the evolution to date of the Artemis program, taking you back to the very beginning through to the end of Q4 2023, and culminating in the current state of the program. We'll go through the origins of Artemis, and the people whose names you should know that were involved in the decision-making processes, along with many of the steps and missteps along the way. And we're going to keep the politics involved here to a minimum, in the episode and in the comments section, but we are all aware that each new federal administration comes in with their own new set of priorities where NASA is concerned. Ever since Kennedy decided to beat the Soviets to the moon in 1962. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. And the Americans did beat them. From the time Kennedy made this speech, it took NASA only seven years of dedicated work to perfect the Apollo program to the point where Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins conducted a flawless Apollo 11 to great fanfare and international attention. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The Apollo Moon Landing Program ran for seven missions, Apollo 11 through 17, with only Apollo 13 not reaching the moon. Apollo 17 splashed down on December 18th of 1972 and concluded that program. Nobody has set foot on the moon since. The Artemis Program, the current moon landing program, was announced on December 11, 2017, exactly 45 years after Apollo 17 touched down on the moon. The announcement made by then-President Donald J. Trump and his Vice President Mike Pence. In case anybody is unaware, currently in the American system of government, the Vice President of the United States is the senior government official directly involved with NASA as the chair of the National Space Council. Created in 1989 under Bush Sr. and Dan Quayle, as a modified version of the National Aeronautics and Space Council that it replaced that ran from 1958 to 1973. That council was mothballed in 1993 when the Clinton-Gore administration was sworn in, remaining inactive through George W.'s tenure and through Obama's as well, during which time the shuttle program and the shuttle replacement program were both shut down for good, costing America the ability to send its own astronauts to space. For his legacy project, Trump brought the NSC back online in 2017, when Pence and Trump signed the White House Space Policy Directive No. 1, setting out the ambitious goal of landing humans on the moon again by the end of what was expected to be Trump's second presidential term ending in 2024, giving NASA the same seven-year time frame it took them to perform that task in the 1960s. The directive I'm signing today will refocus America's space program on human exploration and discovery. It marks an important step in returning American astronauts to the moon for the first time since 1972 for long-term ex exploration and use. This time, we will not only plant our flag and leave our footprint, we will establish a foundation for an eventual mission to Mars and perhaps someday to many worlds beyond. To aid in meeting that deadline, Trump nominated Congressman Jim Bridenstine of Oklahoma as the 13th NASA Administrator in September 2017. Bridenstine was sworn in by Mike Pence after an extended and sometimes painful nomination process in April of 2018. Two years after announcing the Moon Initiative in December of 2019, Trump made another huge announcement creating the fifth arm of the U.S. military called Space Force, attaching it to a $738 billion defense bill and reiterating the 2024 deadline for landing Americans on the moon. To that end, Bridenstine had NASA working up a program paradigm that would not only get human feet back on lunar soil, but would create a system where this could become a regular occurrence instead of a singular spectacle. And in September of 2019, three months prior to the Space Force announcement, NASA had already put out an open call for lunar lander proposals for the program they named Artemis. Several teams submitted bids for consideration, vying for one of the two available contracts. Three teams were picked for further program development on April 30th of 2020. Blue Origin led the national team that included Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Draper, 
each in charge of a major component of the system. Dynetics Human Landing System Team used talents from 25 specialized subcontractors to put together their design proposal. And SpaceX took their concept for HLS from their Mars Starship, modifying their most recent CGI file by removing the heat shield tiles and coloring it white to make it look more like a lunar lander. Musk at the same time was convincing venture capitalists that his 2016 BFR, renamed Starship and revealed in 2019 to great fanfare at Boca Chica, Texas, was going to be sending multiple Starships loaded with supplies to Mars in 2022 to await the arrival of the first Mars colonist in 2024 that would lay the groundwork for his city of a million people on the red planet by 2050. Compared to Mars, the moon should have been easy money for a machine that Musk had been making CGI animations and grand promises about since September of 2016, when he first introduced the ship at a conference in Guadalajara, Mexico. Case in point about a grand promise, the 2018 TED Talk with Gwen Shotwell, promising point-to-point -point rockets on Earth for human travel within a decade. I mean, Gwen, come on, this, this, this is awesome, but it's crazy, right? Like, this is never going to actually happen. Oh no, it's definitely going to happen. This is definitely going to happen. So you really believe this is going to be deployed at some point in our amazing future? When? It will be within this decade. Within a decade. Not this decade. That's certainly amazing. Um. <laughs> Just over four years to go, Gwen. Not liking your chances on making good on that promise. To finance moving the three lunar lander proposals forward, NASA awarded $579 million to the national team, $253 million to Dianetics, and $135 million to SpaceX. For the next year, the teams were to work towards the objective of designing, building out, and testing their proposed vehicles. But before the year was over, the biggest unpredicted problem facing this program would rear its head and change the landscape of this competition. Not knowing what was to come, the three teams went about their business. To make sure they were on the right track in August of 2020, the Blue Origin team delivered a full-scale engineering mock-up of their three-stage machine to the Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility in Johnson Space Center's iconic Building 9. The purpose of the 13-meter tall mock-up was to allow NASA crew to get a feel for the machine, see what works, what doesn't, how panels or controls should be positioned for the crew. It allowed NASA to provide valuable feedback that Blue Origin would then take into consideration for new revisions. Importantly, the lander Blue Origin created was already compatible with existing launch systems and technology, capable of being launched on any heavy rocket. In September of 2020, Dianetics delivered their mock-up as well, again working with the NASA staff to collect information and feedback. Their team provided this concise explanation for the goals of this interaction. We're using this test article for what we call human-in-the-loop task analysis. Simply put, it means we're looking into things like habitable volume, how much space does the crew need to eat, sleep, and live, anthropometric accommodation, how much space do the astronauts need to do every one of their many jobs, how can we make those jobs as easy as possible? And how can we make the space as comfortable as possible when they're not working? Placement and orientation of op components, stowage, and interfaces. Is everything easily accessible? Have we minimized necessary movements? If something goes wrong, how easy is it for the crew to assess the problem and get access to the solution? Intravehicular and extravehicular activities. Can the astronauts move in and through the vehicle comfortably, safely? How easy and safe is it for the crew to exit the vehicle onto the lunar surface and then get back in again? At this point in time, while Blue Origin and Dianetics were already delivering full-scale walkthroughs, empty Starship test articles were just starting to make hops and attempting to land. SN8 left the first of many craters in Boca Chica on December 9th of 2020 during their attempt to land. Super Heavy was still sitting on a drawing board, and no full-scale HLS mock-up was delivered to NASA for their staff to review. Although SpaceX were conducting their first tests on a cable crane required to get astronauts from the Starship airlock, to the surface 30 meters below that hatch. Of course, wire crane platforms like this were something never before accomplished on Earth. And while Musk was treating Southeast Texas like his own private destructive testing range, NASA was still waiting for Musk to deliver on the Crew Dragon system they had contracted from him, something Administrator Bridenstein had to publicly remind Musk about. Jim called Musk out on the mat on Twitter after Musk began to focus on Starship instead of delivering the Crew Dragon. Musk was awarded Crew Dragon Development Approval on September 16, 2014 in the same announcement for the Crew Commercial Program that included the Boeing Starliner. First Crew Dragon demos were to be conducted by 2015 
leading to a functional delivered system by December of 2016. However, NASA wound up spending billions of dollars buying seats on a Russian Soyuz craft to deliver U.S. astronauts to the ISS in the time between when the Crew Dragon was supposed to fly in December of 2016 and when it finally entered service in 2020. In that time, 20 American astronauts had to buy tickets on Soyuz vehicles at an average cost of $81 million per seat. That's over $1.6 billion extra dollars that NASA had to fork out because SpaceX didn't stick to their promised delivery schedule. Meanwhile, Musk was promising that, within a couple of years, his followers would be able to buy $100,000 round-trip tickets to relocate to Mars on Starship. And that was pretty much the state of affairs when the U.S. went to the polls in November of 2020 in an election that surprisingly cut Trump's expected presidency in half. Joe Biden took office in January of 2021, Kamala Harris taking over from Mike Pence as both Vice President of the U.S. and the new chair of the National Space Council. Once again, with the change of administration came a change of priorities for NASA. And those changes were reflected when NASA's 2021 operating budget was announced. Jim Bridenstein, as a former Republican congressman, knew the Democratic president and VP would be replacing him as administrator at NASA, and he had no intention of continuing in his role for them, even if they asked. His resignation was handed in less than a week after the election results were finalized, on November 9th of 2020, leaving the administration of NASA to interim deputies until Bill Nelson was nominated by Joe Biden on March 19th of 2021 and sworn in as the 14th administrator of NASA by Kamala Harris on May 3rd of 2021. Which creates what we believe to be an issue. Because the HLS final selection for multi-billion dollar contracts was hastily announced on a Friday afternoon two weeks prior to Nelson getting sworn in by someone acting of their own singular accord by the name of Kathy Leaders. Leaders took it upon herself to make the HLS selection after Bridenstine left office and before his successor was sworn in. Further, she awarded a single contract instead of the two that were expected to be announced, and she awarded it to SpaceX, the only company to not provide a full-scale concept mock-up, who, leading up to April of 2021, had crashed SN8 on December 9, 2020, and SN9 on Groundhog Day 2021, SN10 exploded on a landing pad on March 3rd of 2021, and SN11 was launched into the morning fog of March 30th of 2021, which didn't even make it back to the ground before it exploded, covering the local protected areas with giant chunks of scrap metal shrapnel. That was the state of SpaceX HLS when Kathy Leaders single-handedly awarded Elon Musk the sole HLS contract to return NASA to the moon. In looking at the 24-page announcement published by NASA regarding her selection process, it needs to be noted that the entire document is written by Kathy Leaders in the first person. My role. I selected. My final determination. And so on. While there is mention of a panel of advisors called the Source Evaluation Panel, herein called the SEP, this decision was not reached by committee. It was decided by and signed off on by Leaders alone before her new boss, Democrat Bill Nelson, could get sworn in. In her words, from the introduction on page 2, In my role as the Source Selection Authority, SSA, for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA or agency, Human Landing System, HLS Option A procurement, for the reasons set forth below, I have selected Space Exploration Technologies Corp., SpaceX, for an HLS Option A contract award. This selection statement documents my independent analysis, and judgment as the SSA and constitutes my final determination on this matter. From page 3, on April 2nd, 2021, I made a determination that it would be in the agency's best interest to make an initial conditional selection of SpaceX to enable the contracting officer, or CO, to engage in post-selection price negotiations with this offeror. Of course, April 2nd of 2021 completely predates when this source selection announcement came out. As contemplated by the solicitation, the government, meaning leaders, instructed SpaceX that it was permitted to change certain price and milestone related aspects of its proposal, e.g., which should be IE. The government requested a best and final price as well as updated milestone payment phasing to align with NASA's budgetary constraints. Neither of the other two companies were afforded the same consideration or information as leaders says right here. After I reviewed this revised proposal 
and consulted with the SCP chairperson and CO, it was evident to me that it would not be in the agency's best interest to select one or more of the remaining offerers for the purpose of engaging with them in price negotiations. Following a final review of the offeror's SEP report and SpaceX's revised pricing proposal, I made final option A selection and award determinations as documented herein. Her summary of evaluation results, found at the top of page 8, showed that the Blue Origin lander only had a technical rating of acceptable, despite being compatible with pre-existing launch technology, and they were given a management rating of very good. SpaceX was also given a technical rating of acceptable, despite having no proven or compatible launch technology, no mock-up, and an extremely complex mission architecture. And they were also somehow given an outstanding for their management rating. We know now, as we knew then, that rating was extremely overstated and undeserved for reasons that become very obvious later. The entire document goes on like this, and we are going to pick it apart shortly, but there's another document that we have to introduce you to first. News of the Soul Award came as a shock to the other two contenders. Both Dianetics and Blue Origin filed protests with the Government Accountability Office, since the HLS competition from the outset had always been for two proposals to move forward into the contract phase. Musk, in typical Arrested Development fashion, couldn't help mocking Bezos with a prepubescent dick joke, even though Musk basically insider traded himself into the Solo Moon contract. In similar fashion, Musk also mocked the design of the original Blue Origin lander with a lame dig about sexual frustration, something that Musk apparently seems to know a great deal about. The GAO rejected both protests, so Blue Origin went further and filed suit against NASA in federal court, arguing the agency failed to properly evaluate its HLS proposal. And from here, we can go to the redacted court documents to discover exactly what happened from Blue Origin's viewpoint. One of the biggest issues facing all parties at this time was the fact that because of the change of administration and their change of priorities, that led to a change in NASA's budget allocation. Artemis was no longer being funded at a level that allowed for two competing HLS systems. There was only barely enough money now for one, thanks to a Senate appropriations bill that was presented the day after Jim Bridenstine handed in his resignation. This bill knocked the HLS allocation down to $1 billion from Bridenstine's request for $3.2 billion for fiscal 2021 at his September 23, 2020 hearing on NASA's budget request. This information was not relayed by Kathy Leaders at NASA to all the offerers. That information was only given to Elon Musk. Leaders displayed textbook favoritism to SpaceX through this action, poisoning the entire process. And that was the basis for the Dianetics and Blue Origin protests. So for this segment, what we're going to do is take complaints from the federal court document filed against NASA by Blue Origin and point to where those complaints are justified in both the 24-page Kathy Leader's Award of HLS Option A and in the 76-page GAO publicly released document that rejected the Blue Origin and Dianetics protests. As a sworn document, we are going to assume Blue Origin had a basis for each of their claims, and we can point to passages in the other documents that make particular claims as plain as day. Now, going through legal documents can be a little bit dry, but bear with us because there's a lot of very important information in here that people have probably not seen before. The first 18 paragraphs form the introductory body to what follows in the 58-page, 175-paragraph document, and we're not going to go through every page and point, mainly the introduction and the highlights, because Blue Origin definitely had a case here. After the introduction paragraph 1, outlining the issues at hand, Paragraph 2 is worth reading verbatim, as it outlines how NASA's decision, and by NASA we mean Kathy Leaders as the signing authority in the HLS Option A procurement, quote, violates fundamental tenets of procurement law and is arbitrary, capricious, and irrational. Historically a staunch advocate for prioritizing safety, NASA inexplicably disregarded key flight safety requirements for only SpaceX in order to select and make award to a SpaceX proposal that NASA's evaluation team assessed as extremely high risk and immensely complex, even before the waiver of safety requirements. The waiver of 13 flight readiness reviews permitted SpaceX to propose a technical solution that included 16 or more launches in a launch cadence the contracting officer admitted was logically inconsistent with the solicitation's requirement for one flight readiness review prior to each launch. In other words, SpaceX's initial proposal was unawardable. 
the agency acknowledged that SpaceX failed to meet a material solicitation requirement, redacted. The agency's decision to select SpaceX's deficient proposal for initial conditional award was irrational and in direct violation of the solicitation's ground rules, stating offers are hereby notified that proposals evaluated as having one or more deficiencies are unawardable. And that pretty much spells everything out. In the GAO decision, this is what we found on pages 9 and 10. This is quoted from the NASA negotiation letter to SpaceX. Given the arguably ambiguous nature of this topic within the Option A solicitation, and the fact that its most stringent possible interpretation, FRR no later than two weeks prior to the launch of each supporting spacecraft, every individual tanker starship is a supporting spacecraft, is logically inconsistent with the technical approach proposed by your firm, i.e. 14 launches, each spaced only 12 days apart from one another. It is NASA's assessment that in order to meet NASA's intent of its FRR requirement for supporting spacecraft, your firm must incorporate additional FRRs for the deleted and tanker starship supporting spacecraft, which is NASA giving Musk specific instructions on how to get their proposal selected for award, which are laid out in even further detail in the following paragraph, quoted from tab 191 of the negotiation letter at 35222. Paragraph 3 relays how Blue Origin protested this award with the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, who agreed that NASA's solicitation required one FRR per each launch of each HLS element, including supporting spacecraft, and proposed the multiple FRRs be required, noting in their determination that SpaceX did not meet that requirement. Further, NASA ignored their own contemporaneous documents arguing these FRRs in their own solicitation of one per vehicle were now somehow not required. Paragraph 4 identifies how NASA changed their positions on the FRRs and their new for litigation position was that they could remove this requirement, should they so choose, on the SpaceX vehicles and orbiting fuel depot that had not yet been designed, let alone become operational. Paragraph 5 states that even the GAO rejected this argument as having insufficient FRRs considering the 16 total launches required for SpaceX's concept of operations. Relevant passages in the GAO decision are located starting on page 71. This is a verbatim read of several paragraphs because the details and the wording in here are very important. As addressed above, SpaceX's concept of operations contemplated 16 total launches consisting of one launch of its deleted and at this point we have to conclude this deletion refers to the SpaceX propellant depot that doesn't exist because we know that an orbiting propellant depot is contemplated in the SpaceX paradigm but the word depot doesn't appear anywhere in this document. Deletions, however, occur in several places where depot would be a logical replacement, like here. 14 launches of its tanker starships to supply fuel deleted, see what we mean, and one launch of its HLS lander starship, which would be deleted. Presumably this would be refilled in orbit and then travel to the moon. The protesters contend that the option A BAA requires an FRR for each launch, or a total of 16 FRRs, one for each launch contemplated by SpaceX's concept of operations. The protesters contend that NASA waived this material requirement when it only required SpaceX to propose three FRRs or an FRR for each type of Starship. NASA argues that the solicitation was ambiguous as to whether an FRR was required for each launch or for the launch of each type of element. The agency explains it reasonably assessed a weakness with SpaceX's proposed management approach because the awardee only proposed one overarching FRR milestone review two weeks prior to the launch of its HLS Starship, which would occur after SpaceX commenced launching its deleted and tanker Starships. As discussed above during post-selection negotiations with SpaceX, NASA required SpaceX to amend its proposal to incorporate additional FRRs to be completed no later than two weeks before, one, the launch of the awardees deleted, and two, the launch of its first of 14 tanker Starships. NASA asserts that SpaceX's subsequent incorporation of these additional two FRRs brought the proposal into compliance with the agency's intent for the FRR requirements. Where a protester and agency disagree over the meaning of solicitation language, we will resolve the matter by reading the solicitation as a whole and in a manner that gives effect to all of its provisions. To be reasonable and therefore valid, an interpretation must be consistent with the solicitation when read as a whole and in a reasonable manner. 
Here, we think the protesters present the more reasonable interpretation of the Option A BAA's FRR requirements. As addressed above, the Option A BAA SOW established a requirement for FRRs, which are reviews designed to determine the system's readiness for a safe and successful flight or launch and for subsequent flight operations. AR Tab 8 Option A BAA Attachment G SOW at 15089. The SOW, Solicitation of Work, provided that FRRs should be completed two weeks before launch of each HLS element. The Option A BAA's milestone acceptance criteria and payment schedule template, which was incorporated as Attachment O, stated that an FRR is required prior to each launch of an HLS element. Propose multiple FRRs as required. Thus, we find that the Option A BAA required an FRR to be completed prior to each launch of an HLS element, which definition includes supporting spacecraft. NASA's competing interpretation would essentially require us to read language out of and into the solicitation's requirement. Specifically, we would need to read supporting spacecraft out of the definition of HLS and the each out of each launch. Additionally, we would need to read in the concept of each element type, specifically that an FRR is only required to be completed prior to the launch of each type of HLS element. As between the two proffered interpretations, we find the protester's interpretation, which relies on the text as written, to be more natural and compelling than the agency's proffered interpretation. In our view, the agency's interpretation would require us to construe the agency's intent based on information not found in the plain text of the solicitation. Thus, where the Option A BAA required an FRR before each launch of an HLS element, SpaceX's three proposed FRRs, or one for each type of HLS element, were insufficient when SpaceX's concept of operations will require 16 total launches. To sum it up, the GAO concluded NASA leaders misinterpreted the language of their own SOW and gave award to a SpaceX proposal that the GAO agreed was insufficient and therefore should have been recorded as a deficiency, this being the argument that forms the core of the Blue Origin lawsuit. But that's not the only way NASA gave preference to SpaceX. Let's go back to their filing. Paragraph 6 describes how the GAO found Blue Origin was not prejudiced against nor harmed by submitting a proposal that adhered to the FRRs as required, declaring Blue Origin's protest invalid, which was a stunning lapse of judgment on the GAO's behalf, especially considering the outcome. Paragraph 7 details further, although redacted, ways in which additional errors in the SpaceX proposal were waived, but only for SpaceX, without the other two offerers being notified. Paragraph 8 informs the court of the following timelines per the solicitation, that the mission preliminary design review must occur no later than July of 2022, L-18 months. The mission critical design review must occur no later than January 2023, L-12 months, and the system's acceptance review must occur no later than September of 2023, L-4 months. As we know all too well at this point, Starship had absolutely no chance in hell of hitting any of those milestone days, because here we are at the beginning of 2024 and test articles are still blowing up on every launch, sometimes twice. Paragraph 9 states that Blue Origin was not made aware by NASA nor the GAO that NASA had relaxed the foundational requirements of the solicitation, such as the FRRs. So Blue Origin was unable to address this issue as it was under seal, and Council could not discuss the issue with Blue Origin, who only found out about this after the ruling was made public on August 10th of 2021. This can only be described as tying Blue Origin's hands behind their back during this critical legal review process. Paragraphs 10 through 12 reads from the GAO decision, a pertinent question whether the protesters would have submitted a different offer that would have had a reasonable possibility of being selected for award had it known that the requirement would be waived. The GAO assumed the answer was no, lacking the information to know the answer would have been yes. And of course, if the terms of the solicitation are changed, it would only make sense for all parties to have an opportunity to address those changes. That is simple fair dealing. Paragraph 13 declares Blue Origin was prejudiced against by the agency's waiver of the FRR and other review requirements without notifying Blue Origin, who would have proposed different technical, management, and price ratings based on the relaxed requirements. Neither Blue Origin nor Dianetics were afforded the opportunity to modify their bids on the same grounds as SpaceX did. 
Paragraph 14 states, the agency, leaders, violated the solicitation, federal procurement regulations and statute, in an implied in fact contract, when it failed to treat all offerors fairly, rationally, and in accordance with the law. And from the information available, there is no denying that to be the case. Leaders stated this fact very clearly, obviously thinking that she could make up the rules as she went, and not even the GAO agreed with how she handled this change of flight readiness review requirements. Footnote 34 deals with the language used by leaders to defend her decision and the GAO's refusal of it. NASA raises other arguments for why it believes that SpaceX complied with the requirement to conduct FRRs for each launch. We do not find the agency's contrary arguments persuasive. For example, the agency argues that SpaceX proposed to delete it. This argument, however, is inconsistent with the Option A BAA SOW's provision that the government will have responsibility for certification of flight readiness and that such reviews were not deleted, which in this case, we're going to conclude, means optional. This is a very interesting footnote in that it quietly states that the agency will bear responsibility for FRR certification, while leaders on behalf of NASA claims 13 such reviews were not going to be required. In paragraphs 15 and 16, Blue Origin contends that NASA, aka leaders, is being duplicitous in this BAA procurement process by stating that the proposals were not to be compared against each other while at the same time demanding they adhere to a 79-page common statement of work, a 49-page common requirements document, and a 155-page data procurement document, but then stating no offerer can challenge the evaluation of another offerer's proposal because they were purportedly not compared. And this duplicity happens again in the evaluation of the certified costs between proposals. Paragraph 17 demonstrates further bias in the process. NASA leaders, quote, through exchanges, provided SpaceX the opportunity to revise its price and management proposal to make its proposal awardable. Under Federal Acquisition Regulations Part 15 Type Discussion Rules, the agency clearly conducted discussions, and if an agency conducts discussions with one offeror, it must conduct discussions with all offerors under consideration for award. On Acquisition.com, we looked up the FAR Regulations Part 15 document, Governing Contracting by Negotiation. At 15306, exchanges with offerers after receipt of proposals, the written rule for limits on exchanges states that government personnel shall not engage in conduct that favors one offeror over another, an edict that was clearly violated in this case when NASA gave SpaceX particular instructions on how to make their bid awardable. Further, at 15307, Proposal Revisions, regulations declare under Section B, the contracting officer may request or allow proposal revisions to clarify and document understandings reached during negotiations. At the conclusion of discussions, each offerer still in the competitive range shall be given an opportunity to submit a final proposal revision. However, the agency, leaders, claims it was not required to conduct discussions with all offerers because the exchanges with SpaceX were not discussions, they were now being called post-selection negotiations. From page 3, a later selection document published April 16th of 2021, on April 2nd of 2021, I made a determination that it would be in the agency's best interest to make an initial conditional selection of SpaceX to enable the contracting officer to engage in post-selection price negotiations with this offerer. This decision was based on NASA's long-standing Option A acquisition strategy of making two Option A contract awards. While it remains the agency's desire to preserve a competitive environment at this stage of the HLS program, at the initial prices and milestone payment phasing proposed by each of the Option A offerers, NASA's current fiscal year budget did not support even a single Option A award. Working in close coordination with the CO, it was therefore my determination that NASA should, as a first step, open price negotiations with the Option A offerer that is both highly rated from a technical and management perspective and that also had, by a wide margin, the lowest initially proposed price, SpaceX. So even though NASA's long-standing Option A acquisition strategy was for making two awards, even though she didn't have enough money for one, leaders went to SpaceX with a suggestion to modify their contract to fit the money available. The issue, of course, is that the post-selection negotiations contained elements that should have been part of the pre-selection discussion between all parties. From paragraph 18, the quote of note here is, SpaceX's initial proposal was unawardable, 
and the agency used post-selection negotiations to allow SpaceX to make changes to render its proposal acceptable to the agency. Had the agency leaders correctly assessed SpaceX non-compliant proposal with a deficiency during the evaluation period, SpaceX's proposal could not have been selected for award. Pursuant to the solicitation's explicit instructions that proposals containing a deficiency are unawardable. The agency engaged in post-selection negotiations in order to correct an evaluation error made during the initial evaluation and to make SpaceX's proposal awardable. Therefore, the post-selection negotiations were part of the evaluation process. Exchanges where an offeror is allowed to revise price and other sections of his proposal are discussions, particularly where these exchanges are part of the evaluation process. The agency, leaders, attempts to circumvent requirements in procurement statute and the federal acquisition regulations regarding discussion by calling them post-selection negotiations. The agency actions here violate fundamental procurement principles regarding fairness. In paragraph 19, Blue Origin sums up the previous facts by saying the proposals were not supposed to be compared or evaluated against each other, but they obviously were. Yet NASA, leaders, claims offerers can't protest the award because the agency's contracting officer stated they were adjudicated independently. While they obviously were not, given the stringent common technical and management requirements laid out in the solicitation's guidelines. Blue Origin pulls no punches in paragraph 20. The agency violated the solicitation, federal procurement regulations and statute, and an implied in fact contract where it failed to treat all offerors fairly, rationally, and in accordance with law. NASA made it clear it would not award to any proposal which contained a deficiency. The solicitation stating offerors are hereby notified that proposals evaluated as having one or more deficiencies are unawardable, which was entirely disregarded when NASA selected SpaceX's non-compliant and deficient proposal for award. Paragraph 21 is another key paragraph, stating NASA admitted SpaceX's initial proposal failed to meet material solicitation requirements, including crucial safety requirements. During Blue Origin's GAO protest, it was eventually revealed that NASA offered SpaceX the opportunity to revise key sections of its initial price, technical, and management proposals, and leaders acknowledged she did not offer the same opportunity to any other offerer. From the Leaders Award document, after I reviewed this revised proposal and consulted with the SEP chairperson and CEO, it was evident to me that it would not be in the agency's best interest to select one or more of the remaining offerers for the purpose of engaging with them in price negotiations. Following a final review of the offerer's SEP reports and SpaceX's revised pricing proposal, I made final option A selection and award determinations as documented herein. As stated by Blue Origin at 21, this makes NASA's award to SpaceX fundamentally arbitrary, unfair, and irrational, giving special assistance to the SpaceX proposal, which still contained deficiencies even at the time of award. Moving further into the document, now we're outlining how SpaceX's paradigm and technical approach requires a minimum of 16 launches, meaning they had to conduct 16 FRRs under the initial solicitation wording. Instead, SpaceX proposed only one flight readiness review, two weeks prior to its final launch. NASA recognized the error in internal documents, but leaders ultimately failed to evaluate SpaceX's technical, management, or price proposals with respect to the extent of this error. And by waiving these requirements, leaders gave SpaceX a huge material advantage over the other offers, removing 13 of the 16 FRRs, each of which would happen on launch pads two weeks prior to launch, eliminates data reviews, accompanying documentation, program reviews, and directly impacts schedules. It also increases risk to the program while demonstrating preferential treatment. Keep in mind, both the Blue Origin and Dianetic systems were designed to be compatible with existing launch technology. The SpaceX HLS required perfecting a launch system on top of creating a lander system. And of course, their launch system continues to encounter serious setbacks on every launch. In paragraph 24, apparently there's even more requirements SpaceX failed to meet, but for some reason, we don't get to see what those are. Paragraph 25 notes that had SpaceX been held to the same standards and assigned the appropriate deficiency, Blue Origin would have been next in line for an award with the next best technical proposal and the next lowest price. So Blue Origin was clearly prejudiced against by these advantages that were afforded only to SpaceX. Further, as stated in paragraph 26, 
Had Blue Origin been made aware of the FRR waiver, they too would have had an opportunity to revise their proposal to increase their chance of award with a lower priced proposal. A proposal from SpaceX that was improperly favored despite being found by the contracting officer to be logically inconsistent with the requirements for 16 FRRs. A call that was obviously overridden by leaders when she made her final determination after her independent analysis. Her adjudication not only ignored critical weaknesses, but also double credited positive attributes. Paragraph 28 goes through some very salient points here, despite the redaction of the first sentence, where the SCP appeared to have some choice, understated words about the Starship proposal, which, one, proposed a risky and undeveloped launch vehicle, which had not been fully designed, much less developed or demonstrated, Two, required this undeveloped launch vehicle and accompanying vehicles to be developed at an extraordinarily rapid pace. Three, requires this launch to be launched, redacted. Four, proposed a launch schedule that requires 16 or more launches with each launch only 12 days apart when FRRs were to be conducted 14 days in advance of each launch. Five, requires never before tested, redacted, but in this case we're concluding the point refers to recovery of the booster with chopsticks because six requires an undeveloped and untested redaction which we are concluding refers to the propellant transfer between starship and the 14 launched fuel tankers and possibly the orbiting fuel depot that does not exist since these were very strong concerns of the SEP, and the award was made to SpaceX by leaders anyway, we can conclude that she ignored these concerns in her independent analysis and final determination. But going back to point four, if there is 12 days between 16 launches, that total system time to prep in orbit will go on for approximately 180 days, six months from the first launch to the final refill barring delays of any kind. And even then, there's only 12 days in between launches, which would make having an FRR for each vehicle two weeks in advance impossible to conduct without having multiple facilities, which SpaceX does not have even today. Nor do they have license to launch that number of vessels from Boca Chica, where they are restricted to five orbital launches per year. This paradigm requires a constant launch schedule where any one element would be cause for appreciable risk, but in combination with little margin for error, is nothing short of irrational. Paragraph 29 notes the change to Artemis funding, thanks to the change in administration, where leaders stated in the award document that the agency now lacks sufficient funding to make even a single HLS award. However, the agency, leaders, changed and waived the FRR requirements with respect to SpaceX without notifying all offerers or amending solicitation to advise all offerers of these funding limitations. We've already shown where these statements appear in her selection document. Paragraphs 32 through 35 show how Blue Origin filed with the GAO in a timely fashion on April 26 of 2021, and how the GAO issued their decision on July 30th of 2021, releasing it publicly on August 10th of 2021. At which time, and only then, Blue Origin became aware of the non-compliance in the SpaceX bid regarding the FRRs. That information was previously sealed as protected material. How the courts expected Blue Origin to plead a case with key evidence like that under lockdown and seal is a complete mystery. Again, they were not playing on a level field. So the nature of the present action is summed up in paragraph 39, seeking to terminate the illegal and erroneous award to SpaceX, conduct meaningful discussion or clarification with Blue Origin as necessary, request final proposal revisions, reevaluate proposals in accordance with the terms of the solicitation, make a valid determination with the terms of the solicitation, make a valid award determination based on the re-performed evaluation, and grant any further relief that the court deem appropriate. Paragraph 43 seems out of place as being under jurisdiction venue and standing and would probably have worked out better under the previous heading. Regardless, this is where Blue Origin informs the court how their proposal was declared ineligible for contract award because it purportedly contained two advance payments, which Blue Origin declares is incorrect and unreasonable. This contract denial on this basis alone was a choice made by leaders, as you can see in her words from page 18 of her selection document. I reviewed the SCP's calculation of Blue Origin's total evaluated price and conclude that it is accurate. Based on the SCP's utilization of multiple price analysis techniques set forth in FAR 15404 1B and G, I have similarly high confidence in its conclusion that Blue Origin's price is fair, 
reasonable, and balanced. Finally, the SEP compared Blue Origin's proposed milestone payment amounts to its monthly expenditures and concluded that the contractor's investment was not unreasonably low or negative during performance, and that Blue Origin is thus assuming a fair sharing of risk throughout contract performance. And that all seems good, right? But then she continues on to say, However, the SEP did identify two instances of proposed advanced payments within Blue Origin's proposal, pursuant to Section 525 of the BAA. Proposals containing any advanced payments are ineligible for a contract award. I concur with the SEP's assessment that these kickoff meeting-related payments are counter to the solicitation's instructions and render Blue Origin's proposal ineligible for award without and this is the important bit, without the government engaging in discussions or negotiations with Blue Origin, either of which would provide an opportunity for it to submit a compliant revised proposal. Going back to the FAR Part 15 document, 15307, that is exactly what the contracting officer is supposed to do. Use discussions to clarify and document understandings reached during negotiations. It's written right into their SOP. Despite the SEP and the SSA both finding that Blue Origin's pricing was fair and accurate and that the company was assuming an appropriate amount of risk, Leaders took it upon herself to use her misinterpretation of the proposal document to declare Blue Origin's proposal ineligible for award. She stated this could have been resolved with Blue Origin through discussions or negotiations, then failed to conduct those discussions or negotiations. As we see later in the Blue Origin filing document under paragraph 111, it would not have even required negotiations. The wording could have been clarified with a single phone call. Yet despite being responsible for a multi-billion dollar award, Kathy Leaders could not be bothered to pick up the phone and make a call to Blue Origin. Whereas she apparently had no problem picking up the phone to tell Musk to rework his proposal to under a specific dollar amount to get the loan available contract. Skipping forward over a lot of duplicated points being proven several different ways to paragraph 79, we see for the first time what the respective numbers for the bids were. Blue Origin's proposal carried a price tag of $5.99 billion across all further stages of development. SpaceX's revised evaluated price was $2.94 billion, but as the section header states, the agency's evaluation determined that SpaceX's HLS Option A proposal failed to meet FRR requirements. So the lower price tag should have had no bearing on this competition, and SpaceX should not have been awarded the contract for the reasons previously stated. But we'll pause here for a second to review these numbers. If $2.94 billion is the best payday SpaceX hopes to receive for meeting all future milestones of their Option A award, they can't possibly be profitable on this contract. In fact, they can't even make up their losses to date. And they've also already received several payments towards that $2.94 billion firm fixed cost. In a Spaces interview hosted by Tim Dodd a month after the IFT-1 disaster, Musk had this to say about the ongoing finances of the Starship program. The cost of all this, like I guess how much do you expect to spend on all that either this year or before you start flying real payloads? Well, it's probably be a couple billion dollars this year, two billion dollars-ish, uh, all in on Starship. And uh, there's a kind of a struggle by other companies to um, raise funds lately for a number of reasons, and SpaceX has usually kind of been insulated from that. Do you see any kind of difference nowadays? Is SpaceX kind of thinking about fundraising differently, and does that affect how, you know, the pressure on this Starship program at all? Uh, we do not uh, anticipate needing to raise funding. We think we, we, we don't, don't, we don't think we need to raise funding. Um, to best of my knowledge, we do not need to raise incremental funding for SpaceX. So, two things here. One, the burn rate at SpaceX for Starship runs about $2 billion per year. Two, Musk said that SpaceX will not need any more outside capital to keep the program running. The $2.94 billion contract that Musk signed with NASA, therefore only provides less than 18 months of capital at their current spending levels. And they don't have anything to show for it yet, least of all any of the requirements and milestones laid out in paragraph 80, despite being awarded an acceptable technical rating by Kathy Leaders. And the thing that is probably most disturbing about the award given to Musk is that, according to paragraphs 101 through 104, jumping ahead a bit, Kathy Leaders contacted SpaceX on April 2, 2021, inviting SpaceX, and only SpaceX, to engage in post-selection negotiations despite the selection letter being released on April 16th of 2021. Not only did leaders allow SpaceX the opportunity to revise its price, payment schedule, review plan, performance work statement, and expenditure profile, 
she told them exactly what funds were being made available for this award. The award, therefore, was not $2.94 billion. It was $2,941,394,557, which is a rather precise number. And still, that's not going to come anywhere close to allowing SpaceX to break even on this contract, even if they manage to meet the requirements of it. Which brings us to Musk's declaration in April that they were not going to require additional funding for Starship. That statement was made following a $750 million raise in January of 2023, based on a $137 billion valuation as reported by CNBC. But after Musk's declaration of financial stability, there was another $750 million raise announced June 24th of 2023 by Yahoo News at a valuation now of $150 billion. Another funding round, their 31st such round, was released on October 6, 2023, announced by Italy's largest bank, Intesa San Paolo, for an unknown investment size at an undisclosed valuation. And in December of 2023, CNBC reported another funding round in the works that jumped the valuation up to $180 billion, $43 billion higher than when it started the year, after two major launch disasters seven months apart. This truly demonstrates how private company valuations are really based on no discernible or reliable metrics. It's simply whatever that last fool paid for a share times the number of shares. In going through web pages looking for information, we came across this page and bookmarked it immediately. USAspending.gov has all the details of the payments made to date on this contract, and it shows that SpaceX, without having a functional rocket, without having demonstrated refilling in orbit, despite not having a full-scale mock-up of the vehicle they intend to land on the moon to complete their contract, has already received the lion's share of the money they were expected to collect upon completion of a successful demonstration proving their ability to perform the Artemis 3 mission. From March 13th of 2020 to December 18th of 2023, SpaceX has received the following payments towards the firm fixed total award of $2.94 billion. After initial award of $94 million, the eight and nine figure chunks of the cash were awarded on July 30th, 2021. That was for $300 million, $98 million more on November 12th of 2021, $84 million on May 11th of 2022, $344 million June 30th of 2022, 315 million on September 2nd, 2022, 147 million November 15th of 2022, 427 million on February 22nd of 2023, and 337 million on September 14th of 2023. Now, when did Kathy Leaders retire from NASA? Right about here, after SpaceX had already collected 1.83 billion of their $2.94 billion contract. So Musk has burned through this $2 billion call it another $2 billion raised in 2023 with another round at a fool's valuation, and another $2 billion worth of funding rounds in 2022. That's $6 billion right there, with zero chance of making a profit on Artemis 3, even if Musk could get Starship to the moon safely. All things considered, Bezos' number of $5.99 billion was obviously a much more reasonable assessment of the program cost, and this is a great example of why tendered contracts should not always go to the lowest bidder. Paragraph 115 is headed, the agency made a single award to SpaceX in spite of communicating intent to offerers to make multiple awards. That was the deal all parties entered into, that the field would be narrowed from three to two, not from three to one, especially when the one that was selected was shown preferential treatment at the expense of the other two. As paragraph 118 correctly states, NASA leaders made this selection based on price, my selection determination for SpaceX's proposal is based upon the results of its evaluation considered in light of the agency's currently available and anticipated future funding for the Option A effort. Which brings us to the five counts Blue Origin brought against NASA in this federal lawsuit. All the details of each count are detailed in the text beneath them, most of which we covered already. Count 1. Unlawful waiver of material solicitation requirement. Count 2. NASA leaders engaged in improper and unequal discussions. Count three, failure to amend solicitations with change in requirements. Count four, failure to evaluate SpaceX proposal in accordance with the solicitation. And count five, breach of implied in fact contract of good faith and fair dealing. So what was the point of launching the lawsuit? For that, you have to look to the prayer for relief at the end of the document. Blue Origin wanted the court to A, declare that Kathy Leader's award of the HLS Option A contract to SpaceX 
was arbitrary, capricious, and abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance with law. B. Wanted the court to enjoin, meaning urge, NASA and SpaceX to not continue the performance of that contract. C. Wanted the court to direct NASA to open discussions with all offerers that would allow proposal revisions, reevaluate revised proposals, and make new selection and award. And D. Have the attorney cost covered for making what was actually a very reasonable request that should have been supported by the GAO in the first place. It's important to realize that Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin did not lose this case. Despite the rock-solid reasoning in their complaint and the ability to call out leaders' duplicity according to the government's own FAR Part 15 standards, the case was never heard. The federal judge granted the government's motion to dismiss and deferred the decision-making authority back to the GAO, who stuck by Kathy Leader's selection even though the GAO appeared to be well aware the SpaceX bid had severe shortcomings. Then leaders, in turn, ignored any recommendations the GAO provided to her, such as requiring the additional FRRs. This action will wind up backfiring on the GAO in a big way, as we'll go through shortly. After the dismissal, Musk, of course, took another immature opportunity to gloat at Bezos' expense, accusing Jeff Bezos of retiring from Amazon only to pursue a full-time job at Blue Origin suing SpaceX, which is obviously false on a couple of fronts. This suit wasn't against SpaceX or Musk at all. Blue Origin's case was against NASA, and it was not a frivolous lawsuit as many claimed it was either. It had a solid foundation. What it didn't have were the right ears listening to what it was saying. Having followed the development, or rather lack of development, of Starship for a couple years at this point, and having gone through weaknesses we saw in the vehicle, along with Starship's physical inability to make good on the promises Musk has made on its behalf, we had some very simple advice for Jeff Bezos and the team at Blue Origin that we shared in a tweet on August 18th of 2021. We said Bezos is playing this wrong. All he's got to do is keep plugging away at his system and have it ready when Starship fails. NASA will be knocking on his door eventually. It was completely obvious to us that Musk was not going to make good on his deadlines for Starship. So where Bezos and Blue Origin were protesting the selection with near-field goggles, we were looking down the road to when Starship proved to be as incompetently executed as we fully expected. At the time, Bezos was even willing to eat $2 billion of development cost to continue with the HLS program. Turns out it's a good thing NASA rejected that proposal. It saved him $2 billion. So now that we've gone through all the dry legal stuff, let's see how Blue Origin reacted after the case ended in part three. We've gone through this before in other episodes, but this segment bears another updated mention. Although Bezos and Musk are among the richest men in the world, at least on paper, and both of them have competing aspirations in space, there is one key difference between the two men and the two companies, and that difference permeates throughout both companies' modus operandi. That difference answers this question. Where does the money for the company operations come from? Fans of Elon Musk are under the misguided impression that because SpaceX is a Musk company, that Musk finances the company out of his own pocket. Musk holds 42% of SpaceX shares that, through some form of corporate malfeasance, gives him almost double the voting power in this private company. A double-up scenario that he's just recently suggested he needs to have in Tesla before he'll deliver on long-standing AI and robotics claims. But this share structure in no way reflects the amount of money that Musk has personally put into the company. In the beginning, yes, Musk took a portion of his windfall from the sale of PayPal, thanks to Peter Thiel, despite Musk having nothing to do with the creation of nor development of the PayPal application, and despite being fired for incompetence within months of becoming the CEO for a very short period of time. When X.com, a failed financial platform, combined with Confinity, the company that created and developed PayPal, Musk was assigned an 11.7% share of the company. And that's where his money came from, $175 million and change. When Peter Thiel orchestrated the sale of PayPal to eBay after Peter Thiel took the company public. Musk did not make Musk rich. We have Peter Thiel to blame for that. Anyway, Musk took $100 million of that unearned payday and founded SpaceX with it. Then burned through all of it, developing Falcon 1. The company was in financial ruin when SpaceX finally managed to successfully launch the fourth Falcon test flight on September 28, 2008, thereby securing NASA funding for the program. And for that, Musk can thank SpaceX employee number one, Tom Mueller. 
With the NASA blessing came Musk's ability to raise more funding through the venture capital community. And it is this trough of money that Musk has returned to time and time again over the years to keep the lights on at SpaceX. Despite Musk saying publicly, even as recently as April of 2023, that SpaceX would not need to raise further funding, SpaceX has taken in over $10 billion across 33 funding rounds from 85 different investors, with their first billion dollar raise in 2015 from Google and Fidelity, when Musk started talking about taking the BFR to Mars and ridiculously suggesting warming up the entire planet using thermonuclear weapons, as he did in this segment on The Tonight Show with Stephen Colbert. You, you sincerely think that we should go to Mars, like men and women should go to Mars. Yeah. Why do we want to go to Mars? It's uninhabitable. How it's long a, before we could turn Mars into well, some place where we could live? It, it, it is a fixer upper of a planet. How would you do that? The fast way is, is drop thermonuclear weapons over the poles. You're a super villain. Yeah. NASA and many other actual scientists, by the way, have already torn that concept to shreds especially when the plan Musk is talking about requires 10,000 nuclear bombs. So anybody wearing one of these t-shirts that says Nuke Mars really should have gotten a free hat with every purchase. Since getting a Starship to Mars has not happened, nor is it ever likely to happen, but Musk still needs to keep that money flowing into this bottomless pit. He continuously relies upon his legions of fans and sycophant YouTube channels to generate the hype required to keep VCs and angel investors interested in participating, despite the cost per company share going through the roof. To give you an idea how ridiculous this valuation is, ULA, who has been NASA's go-to proven launch provider for 20 missions to Mars, carries all manner of payloads to all elevations of orbit, and recently successfully tested their new Vulcan Centaur rocket, who over the course of 15 years and over 600 launches with their Atlas program, with a 100% mission success rate, was recently rumored to be for sale for around $5.2 billion, which would be here on this graph. So whenever Musk blows up a launch pad or scatters a starship across Hell's Half Acre, that is not his money he set ablaze. And because it's not his money, he seems to have very little regard for it. Long story short, Musk needs to keep Starship in the limelight and keep that hype going because he needs venture capital money to finance his operation. But Bezos does not. He doesn't need to stay in the limelight because he doesn't require the venture capitalists. Because he is, in fact, financing his own space company himself. According to Crunchbase, where SpaceX has 85 investors, Blue Origin has two, but two very important ones. They are NASA and the United States Space Force. Where Musk has burned through $10 billion of investors' money across 33 funding rounds, Jeff Bezos has taken $167.4 million in grants to develop contracts for NASA and USSF prior to December 3, 2021. So where does the rest of the money for the Blue Origin program come from? Quite simply, it comes from Bezos' own pocket. Since the company was founded in the year 2000, Bezos has personally ponied up in the neighborhood of $20 billion of his own wealth, selling off a billion dollars worth of Amazon every year to fund activities, like developing the new Shepard and new Glenn spacecraft, alongside an array of engines, including the BE-7, BE-3, and the BE-4, a pair of which recently launched the ULA Vulcan Centaur into space on January 8, 2024, marking the first successful launch using American-made methane-fueled rockets. Because Bezos has not required outside funding sources, he hasn't needed to publicize every single minute detail of the vehicle or engine development, which means most of what has happened at Blue Origin has been perfectly fine happening behind closed doors. Now getting back to the HLS timeline to recap, when Kathy Leaders awarded SpaceX the sole HLS contract on April 16th of 2021, SpaceX had no full-scale mock-up of their HLS design and had not successfully landed a single test article without incident. When the GAO denied the protest in July of 2021, SpaceX had managed to land one empty test article, SN15, which didn't explode, but did catch fire on the landing pad. And when the federal judge rejected the case being made by Blue Origin on November 4th of 2021, no further Starship test launches had been conducted nor progress made. Three weeks after the federal judge rejected the claim to reopen negotiations using a level playing field, Musk revealed through an email and tweet relayed on Thanksgiving weekend of 2021 
that the Raptor program was facing a production crisis, and he recalled Hawthorne SpaceX employees on their Thanksgiving holiday weekend to address this newest existential crisis for the company. This was following the resignation of longtime 2009 SpaceX alumni Will Heltsley, Vice President of Propulsion, within a week of Lee Rosen, Vice President of Mission and Launch Operations, who left after eight years. Colonel Rosen's right-hand man, Ricky Lim, the Senior Director of Mission and Launch Operations from the class of 2008, also turned in his keys. And several other SpaceX employees also headed down the road after they were able to vest their employees' stock at 560 per share prior to the 10 to 1 split. So there's some perfect examples of the outstanding management team that Kathy leaders signed off on. Around the same time, a group of SpaceX employees wrote a letter to Chief Operating Officer Gwen Shotwell because they were frustrated by the constant negative press Elon Musk was bringing to their program, identifying Musk as a distraction and an embarrassment, and calling for a public separation between the company and Musk's conduct, which included sexual harassment allegations. Those allegations stemmed from Musk offering a company flight attendant a horse in return for a handjob after getting a massage from her while aboard the company jet in flight. SpaceX wrote the woman a check for a quarter million dollars to keep quiet on the matter. Small wonder the employees wanted more distance between themselves and their scandalous CEO. But rather than taking her employee concerns into consideration, Shotwell backed Musk and fired all her employees on the spot. Despite some of these employees being department heads, nine people all told were fired as a result of that letter of concern and they immediately filed legal complaints in June of 2022. On January 3, 2024, the National Labor Relations Board found in the employees' favor, determining their firings were illegal and requiring SpaceX to settle the charges, likely by reinstating the employees and paying back wages. Failure to settle the charges will result in a hearing on March 5, 2024. But the day after the NLRB ruling on January 4th of 2024, SpaceX sued the NLRB over their decision, calling it unconstitutional. So this matter will remain before the courts. Just one more example of the outstanding management practices conducted at SpaceX. That was the state of the Starship HLS program going into 2022. A crisis with the Raptors, bankruptcy looming, top brass running out the door, and employees being illegally fired for speaking up on behalf of their company. Although Musk had promised his fan base that SN15 would relaunch within days after landing and catching fire in May, SN15 would not fly again and was ultimately scrapped. The next time a vehicle lifted off from Boca Chica, it was the infamous IFT-1 flight on April 20th of 2023, almost two years after SN15. Now, during that time, what was Blue Origin up to? Well, for starters, on July 20th of 2021, in between the GAO determination and the federal court dismissal, Blue Origin launched their first manned new Shepard capsule atop its reusable booster powered by their own BE-3 engine, bringing four passengers to the edge of space to experience weightlessness at the apex of a 10-minute journey that crossed the Kármán line. Notably, Jeff Bezos and his brother Mark were both aboard for this inaugural manned flight, meaning Bezos trusted this machine enough to personally test it out, with his brother and two other people, Wally Funk and Oliver Damon. The flight from Launch Site 1 in West Texas was flawless, the landing of the booster perfect, the manned capsule landing on solid ground using a combination of parachutes and a last second thruster burst before touching down. This was followed by a payload mission consisting of 18 commercial payloads in the crew capsule, and a NASA Lunar Landing Technology demonstration installed on the exterior of the booster. Further manned flights went flawlessly in October 21st, with Captain Kirk himself taking part, then additional manned flights in December of 2021, March of 2022, June of 2022, and August of 2022. The next flight of New Shepard, an unmanned research mission in September of 2022, failed due to an issue with the BE-3 engine but that event proved that the crew abort system powered by Aerojet Rocketdyne worked as intended by saving the capsule, quickly removing it from the incident, and landing it safely despite losing their booster. After a 14-month hiatus, while we were putting this series together, Blue Origin returned to space with the successful launch of NS-24, including the ninth recovery of this particular booster and the soft landing of their cargo capsule, carrying experiments for 33 different customers. While Bezos was proving out the abilities of New Shepard, 
In February of 2022, Musk gave a long overdue update on Starship. Musk had been promising a release of final Starship details and internal diagrams to his fan base by the end of October of 2020. And at that time, Musk was saying SpaceX could launch their first orbital flight test by November of 2021. Of course, that never happened. The interior layouts have never been released for review. And as it turned out, Musk had very little to nothing to add in the 2022 presentation compared to the same style presentation that he did in 2019. Our episode on this event laid out how it was pretty much a point-for-point -point carbon copy of the 2019 presentation, with some minor details that only came out really during the Q&A. SpaceX had not even begun looking at interior designs or things like life support systems yet. Despite Musk saying he planned on hijacking designers from Tesla for that purpose in claims dating back to at least August of 2020. Musk was queried about this directly by Kevin Haymeyer from Space Eccentric. My viewers are really hungry to know anything about the interior design for crewed Starship. Uh, you have HLS, you have Dear Moon, and last we heard, maybe a year or two ago, you were looking to hire Tesla employees to design the interior for Starship. How's that going? We, we, have, we aren't focusing a lot on the interior quite yet. I mean, that will be important down the road, but our focus right now is just getting to orbit and proving out uh, return of the booster and return of the ship. Another point that's very interesting from the 2022 presentation was brought up by Lauren Grush from The Verge. I'm wondering if you can clarify the number of launches that you plan to conduct in order to do these refillings. I know a lot of numbers have been thrown around, so I'm wondering if you have landed on a final number. And how quickly do you plan to launch those missions back to back to refuel the vehicle to get to the moon? The missions would, would happen pretty fast for um, refilling the, the vehicles uh, to minimize oil off of the cryogenic propellants. Uh, but we'd probably be launching, I don't know, probably uh, every few hours. Every few hours, he says, they'll be launching propellant tanker flights for the HLS headed to the moon. But even Kathy Leader's glowing recommendation of the HLS paradigm had the launch rate, as per the SpaceX proposal, at one every 12 days. Demonstrating that when talking about Starship, Musk continually pulls numbers out of his thin hair. On April 20th of 2023, 23 months after the SN15 launch and pad fire, SpaceX stacked Starship 24 atop booster number 7 and lit the fuse on what would become an ecological bombshell and vehicle disaster that laid waste to the Stage 0 facility and surrounding protected wildlife preserves, culminating in the loss of vehicle only minutes into the launch. The disaster in the air and on the ground sparked a major investigation that will last for months involving the FAA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the state of Texas. This disaster also prompted a collaboration of local and environmental groups to file suit in federal court against the FAA and SpaceX, which, unless we missed an announcement somewhere, that legal action is still in motion. But in our opinion, the most notable outcome of this event was this. By May 19, 2023, one month after Starship IFT-1 failed miserably at its attempt to get to orbit, NASA had figured out a way to bankroll a second lunar landing system for Artemis V. And guess who they called? They went right back to Blue Origin's team, which now included Lockheed Martin, Draper, Boeing, Astrobotic, and Honeybee Robotics. Blue Origin's national team was awarded a $3.4 billion contract to double up on the SpaceX HLS program, and although their overall design from their previous concept underwent a complete do-over, once again, Blue Origin already has a full-scale mock-up delivered to NASA for review, comments, and suggestions, delivered in October of 2023. According to current timetables, the Artemis V craft would be headed to the moon no earlier than 2029, and the launch vehicle of choice now is the Blue Origin New Glenn rocket. Coincidentally, a New Glenn first stage was recently spotted outside the Blue Origin hangar at Cape Canaveral, with no big fanfare or need for public announcements. The image was captured by a drone over Cape Canaveral that was not expecting to see the vehicle being transported. And that's another thing worth noting about Blue Origin. They are developing their vehicles at a proper, established space facility in Florida, without having to destroy nature preserves and state parks. Another example of the Blue Origin team going about their work as normal, and obviously making progress towards their goals. 
For over two years now, we have referred to this competition between SpaceX and Blue Origin as a modern day version of the tortoise and the hare. The hare, Musk, being the loud, braggadocious, conceited competitor who feels the need to belittle his competition. Case in point is when Musk was referring to the Blue Origin lander in terms of sexual frustration, as a junior in high school might do. Then mocking Bezos again after Musk basically bought himself the bid for the initial HLS contract. Musk has been relying on an iterative development program to drive what was advertised as a quicker form of rocket development while effectively turning Boca Chica, Texas into a pockmarked wasteland. That process is on constant display on YouTube 24-7 thanks to channels like NASA Spaceflight who speculate on every form of activity at both the manufacturing hub and the launch pad site. This particular stream has been running non-stop since July 12th of 2021. And unless we're mistaken, this looks an awful lot like repairs on the orbital launch pad that Musk announced was undamaged during IFT2 at 2.30 in the morning. These video feeds catch every movement, every component, every explosion, and then those are rebroadcast by the likes of muskrats, like Zach at CSI Starbase, and Tim at Everyday Astronaut, who reportedly spent a quarter million dollars in studio gear to specialize in Boca Chica launch activity videos after picking up stakes from Iowa and moving to Texas, only to have giant gaps of time in between anything worth covering as environmental investigations take months to conduct after every explosion. Considering this Eric Berger article was from February of 2020, stating Musk at the time was driving hard towards an orbital flight that year, and four years later that still hasn't happened, it's fair to say the iterative process has not measured up to expectations. Blue Origin's tortoise, on the other hand, is not interested in showing their machines off to the world until they've been engineered properly and are ready to go. And the motto at Blue Origin supports the slow and steady wins the race morality. Their motto is gratitum ferociter, step by step, ferociously, as seen here in the ribbon at the foot of the Blue Origin coat of arms. Notice anything else about that image that's interesting? These two characters here? Those are tortoises. Funny story, we were pretty shocked to find this article and this image from 2016 during our web search, and even more surprised that the reason why they're in the coat of arms is due to the tortoise and the hare fable crossed with a sniper's credo that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Up until a couple of days ago, we had never seen that crest, so coming across that was good for a laugh. Anyhow, that mentality is reflected in the stats for New Shepard. In 24 launches of that vehicle between October 19th to 2012 and December 2023, there were only two launches that had issues. In 2015, NS-1 had a successful launch and the capsule reached its elevation, but the booster crashed on landing. And the other issue we covered already, the failure of the booster and activation of the emergency abort system in 2022. That failure has since been tracked down to the nozzle of the BE-3 engine overheating. The other 22 missions went off exactly as expected. So the expectation at Blue Origin for each launch is to have a successful mission. None of this icing on the cake crap for clearing the tower. At Blue Origin, success is the expectation compared to Musk's mentality of success maybe, excitement guaranteed, a motto that has to make aerospace engineers cringe every time they hear it. It certainly leaves us wondering why Musk has been allowed to go on with this program as long as he has to date without any apparent adult supervision. Now as it turns out, Blue Origin, the tortoise, is set to upstage Musk, the hare, in a big way in 2024 by being the first of the two companies to deliver a satellite payload to Mars with a contract they swiped right from underneath Musk's nose. NASA's mission, Anagram Escapade for Escape and Plasma Acceleration and Dynamics Explorers, announced in March of 2020 that SpaceX would be launching the two Escapade craft and the Psyche probe on the same Falcon Heavy launch in 2024. However, it was determined that Falcon Heavy would not have been up to performing both tasks on the same launch. So Escapade was pulled from the manifest and Psyche launched earlier on October 12th of 2023 instead, leaving Escapade without a ride. And on February 9th of 2023, NASA announced their intention to award the Escapade mission to Blue Origin, giving the new Glenn rocket a Mars delivery mission on its maiden flight. Because Escapade is a Mars mission with an 11 month delivery time, Rather than the home and transfer orbit timing for craft taking six to nine months, which for 2024 lasts from October 17th to about November 2nd, 
Blue Origin is provisionally looking at having this launch set to go for a window between August 6th and 15th. Funnily enough, NASA re-released that information a couple days after the disastrous outing from Starship IFT-2, which we dissected in detail shortly after both Starship and Super Heavy exploded several minutes apart after their early morning launch on November 18th of 2023, resulting in yet another FAA investigation, which is still underway as of the date of this release in February of 2024. So the current state of the two HLS programs can be summed up like this. Must Starship to date after almost a decade of development and two failed attempts to reach orbit in April and November of 2023, has not proven the safety of their system despite originally being required to deliver an HLS lander and launch system to NASA by 2025. Before that, they need to conduct a demo mission. Before that, they have to figure out how to conduct on-orbit refilling because the Starship cannot get to the moon without having those logistics in place. To do that, they still need to produce a Starship tanker design and a propellant depot design. SpaceX still has no full-scale mock-up of the HLS lander they plan on using, and according to Musk from the Starship Update 2022, they hadn't even started looking at the interior design or life support systems for that craft. In between FAA investigations, they continue to fly test articles that don't actually mimic the HLS lander, and to date, they still haven't attempted to recover a single Super Heavy booster with the chopsticks, even before those craft blew up over the Gulf of Mexico. There is no plan to recover them with the tower, and that technology would appear to be key. In the meantime, there's another contract Musk has fallen well short of, and that's the Dear Moon private mission financed by on-again, off-again billionaire Yusaku Meizawa. First announced in February 2017 as a two-person flight in a Crew Dragon 2 capsule, then reimagined and announced in September of 2018 using a BFR. That mission was supposed to go around the moon with a crew of nine accompanying the billionaire in 2023. And of course, that didn't happen. And it's been pushed off indefinitely past 2024. In our opinion, Meizawa should either demand a refund or accept that his money is gone. But we all know this is never happening. And that inevitable cancellation will probably hit Tim Dodd the hardest as one of the longest standing Musk disciples who built his entire persona and YouTube following on Starship. So remember how we said before that Musk needs to keep generating hype around Starship using his sycophants and fanboys? This is a perfect example of a Musk hype machine that generated huge public interest in what he's doing and built up the genius mythos that Musk thrives on. Yet when these same projects fail to come to fruition, they all die quiet deaths and nobody ever calls Musk out on it. Musk has been promising the Starship BFR ITS MCT since 2015. He's been promoting it since 2016 as a Mars colonization vehicle. But after a decade of development and promises, this vehicle has not reached orbit. In comparison, the first test tank for New Glenn was created in 2021, about two years ago. And the methane-powered BE-4 rocket engine went through enough testing at ULA and NASA to be mounted to their Vulcan Centaur launch from January 2024. That proven engine is now set to go into mass production. So given their recent rate of progress, there is no reason to think that Blue Origin will have any issues meeting their target date. The new Glenn rocket with reusable booster that Blue Origin and NASA plan on using for the mission will be launching in August 2024 on that mission to Mars, giving Blue Origin five years to work out any issues that present on that launch before being called upon for Artemis 5. Meanwhile, the Government Accountability Office, remember them, the organization that backed Kathy Leader's sole award of HLS to SpaceX, they released a report in November of 2023 that declares Artemis 3 is going to have to get pushed back to at least 2027. Two primary reasons are given, and to nobody's surprise, the current state of the Starship HLS program is the long pull on that mission. Issues with the Axiom pressure suits that NASA is renting from that company also need to be resolved, as the company remedies design issues from the specs NASA provided them to work with, specifically regarding emergency life support duration, but now that company has more than three years to work on it. Remember when Musk was asked directly about Starship readiness in the Tim Dodd Twitter Space interview right after the IFT-1 launch? Here's the question and his response. Do you expect HLS, Starship HLS, to be the long pole for Artemis 3? No, I, I, I definitely don't. I, th I think we will be, we will be 
the first thing to be really be, I, I think we'll, no, I think we will be for the, yeah, but that we will not be a limiting factor at all. Maybe if Musk was not so preoccupied with Twitter, he might be more aware of these schedule slips ahead of time. Which brings us to another big difference between Bezos and Musk, something Bezos brought up during his recent interview with Lex Friedman. Blurgeon needs to be much faster, and it's one of the reasons that I left my role as the CEO of Amazon. Blurgeon needs me right now. And so I had always, when I was the CEO of Amazon, my point of view on this is if I'm the CEO of a publicly traded company, it's going to get my full attention. It was very important to me. I felt I had an obligation to all the stakeholders at Amazon uh, to do that. Um, and so having you know, turned the CEO, I was still the executive chair there, but I turned the CEO role over. And the reason, <laughs> the primary reason I did that is so that I could spend time on Blue Origin adding some you know, energy, some sense of urgency. We need to move much faster. It would appear that having a full-time CEO that's involved and engaged might be beneficial to a company. But going back now to the GAO report, not only did the GAO gut any hopes of having a lunar mission in 2025, another report put out by NASA advisors recognizes that Musk was lying in his assessment that Starship would only require four to eight launches to get the ship refilled in orbit for the trip to the moon. The analysis showed that close to 20 launches will be required, and that number will fluctuate a great deal depending on how the company intends to deal with boil-off of propellants while in orbit awaiting further refill. Boil-off is a natural evaporation process occurring within cryogenic liquids, and the vapors need to be vented to maintain the pressure and temperature within the propellant tanks. Direct sun hitting the side of a tanker in orbit would only accelerate this process on a tank that is not properly insulated, but insulation can only slow that process down. And the longer the ship is parked, the more propellant will be lost to boil off. These findings were right in line with the frame that Bezos submitted as evidence in his protest against the award to SpaceX. Muskrats were up in arms about this frame, saying Bezos was just making this up to create fear and doubt in the Starship system. Not realizing, of course, that this information was taken directly from the GAO's own filings, which were based directly from the SpaceX submission. And now there's no doubt remaining that this is the paradigm NASA has to deal with when using Starship for an HLS mission. As Bezos properly claimed on this frame, this architecture is immensely complex and high risk. Now, finally, the experts at NASA agree with him. Which should make the panel at the GAO feel a little foolish for standing by the Kathy Leader's assessment of the Starship HLS program. Speaking of Kathy Leaders, let's wrap up her story. As it turns out, after leaders rushed through and signed off on the Starship HLS award, before Bill Nelson could take the helm at NASA in May of 2021, and doled out billions of dollars to SpaceX, even though, as the GAO reports, the company has made limited progress towards its goals, leaders retired from her quarter million dollar a year salary at NASA in March of 2023, three weeks before the 420 Starship IFT-1 disaster. Three weeks after Starship laid waste to Boca Chica, it was announced that leaders had been hired by Musk to be the Starship program manager in Boca Chica, overseeing the very same multi-billion dollar lunar landing project that she greenlit when she was still a government employee. Now it's her job to apologize to her former employer while the company she chose for that contract suffers failure after failure. After IFT2 blew up twice, Guess who had to stand in front of the press at the Brownsville Apology Tour, trying to spin that double disaster as a data gathering success? It is a very, very exciting time for us here at SpaceX. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our, where we are today and where we wanna be. And then obviously I'm gonna bask in a little bit of the glow of Flight 2 because that was a phenomenal um, event for me and being able to be on the edge of Sanchez lot and being able to watch that, that launch was a, just a once in a lifetime experience for me. Can you tell us the main take takeaways from the le recent launch? Oh, I kind of stepped through a lot of them. I mean, man, we were so happy that the 33 engines, everything went it, nominal trajectory. That always, you hear those words on the, on the feed, you're just like, you love it, you know. Um, 
Hot stage worked beautifully. Like I already said, the uh, I had my low ratios done, but the six engines on the Starship all lit and went. Um, its, its trajectory went well. Um, so just being able to see that amount of improvement in you know, the five months of getting the next vehicle ready to go, people, we were really, really excited. It really set us up then for the next phase. Basically, we proved out the booster and the booster was successful on its second voyage. So that was pretty phenomenal. From NASA sweetheart to Musk apologist, in a matter of weeks, what a complete fall from grace. And three days after leader's first day at work at SpaceX, NASA found the money to award the second HLS contract to Blue Origin. How fitting will it be when Starship fails to meet the contract benchmarks with Kathy Leaders at the Starship helm, a failure that will completely tarnish a once remarkable aerospace career? For those people who think Leaders didn't rush the decision on HLS, who believe she actually made the right call and was well within her rights making the award, you need to consider this undeniable fact. The SpaceX HLS CGI, which is all it has ever been with no full physical form to date, relies on a cable crane we mentioned earlier to get people from the airlock of the vehicle to the surface and back. And if anyone thinks this airlock crane looks like a finished, usable concept, they need to give their heads a shake. Not only was this critical access system not fully worked out, the HLS that was awarded the contract contained no redundancy for when this system breaks down. What was achieved by both the Dianetics Alpaca and the contemporaneous Blue Moon vehicle with a ladder, neither of which required power or mechanics to run. The exact opposite is true on Starship. Something Leaders was made aware of by the selection evaluation panel, but she hand waved it. Not only was there no redundancy built into the machine then, according to a recent NSF interview with people working on Artemis at NASA, there is still no backup plan for when that platform becomes inoperable. Um, is astronaut training in y'all's purview, or how does that responsibility break down? Yeah, so astronaut training, as you might imagine, is done mostly by Houston. Um, that's where the astronauts are. They have a ton of facilities down there. So here's a great picture of um, learning how we're going to get to and from the surface using this elevator, which as the surface lead is a fascinating and also very, um, <laughs> uh, it's a very complicated system. Well, not complicated. It's just, it's, it has to work. Um, it's not what we did on Apollo. It's a new system. Um, it's, I, I think about this thing a lot and, and luckily we're building full scale mockups and testing it. Um, what happens? Like, Alicia, you live in New York. You ever been stuck in an elevator? Yes. Like. <laughs> Elevators break down here all the time. <laughs> so the way we manage that, and that this is this is a great example of needing to be able to pull the requirements up to the highest level possible, right? Um, but we are very concerned, like you guys were just talking about, like we definitely don't want a stuck elevator on the surface of the moon, both because especially for the first missions where we only send two crew down, there's nobody in the lander to help them get back up. Um, but also we have very tight time constraints on certain portions of the mission. So you need to, you have to have the crew be able to get back inside the lander um, within a certain time frame. So what we, what we ended up doing is we wrote what we call like fault tolerance and reliability requirements. The elevator still uh, has to be able to work even if uh, some sort of failure happens um, or you need to be able to meet a certain like reliability metric that there's only like a very tiny percentage of a chance of the overall system failing, use, you know, and you kind of grade that with like test data and analysis data and all sorts of things. Um, so because the the core need is for the crew to be able to get back in the back in the lander, we specify those higher level things like the fault tolerance or failure tolerance and the reliability. Could you put in a ladder too? <laughs> or something like that, like a mitigation. There's a slide maybe? A slide, yes. In layman's terms, because there's no physical redundancy for this elevator, these two NASA leads on Artemis told SpaceX, instead of making the elevator good, we need you to make it like really, really good instead to cut down on the odds of it breaking. Which, given the reputation Musk has regarding overall quality control, is probably not a wise move. Kathy Leaders for the L for signing off on the only lunar lander of the bunch that decided to put the solitary access point for it 30 meters above the ground. Something Logan said here as a throwaway has a lot more gravitas than he gave it. It's not what we did on Apollo. It's not what we did on Apollo. And that is going to bring us to the final segment of the series.
another YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day featuring Dustin Sandlin, an aerospace engineer, missile technologist, veteran, and PhD student, released a video on December 3rd, 2023, outlining issues with the Starship HLS Artemis paradigm and the larger implications of it. For this video, he was a keynote speaker at the October 2023 Von Braun Space Exploration Symposium titled Advancing Space from LEO to Lunar and Beyond. Since the current NASA framework for these goals is Artemis, and Destin had some concerns about the program, he decided that out of concern for this mission, he needed to relay some hard truths to the people in the room, specifically about the mission architecture of Artemis 3, and the failure of people to speak up when tough questions are asked, even when lives hang in the balance. The more I started digging into Artemis, the more I realized there might be some issues in how people communicate about it. Like there's some architecture problems. This is the truth and this is what needs to be said. And NASA, please don't hate me. The first time we came across Destin's channel was in the very beginning of our channel. His episode Touring ULA with Tori Bruno, released on February 29th, 2020, called How Rockets Are Made. If you want to watch a walkthrough video of a proper rocket factory hosted by an aerospace engineer who is having a great conversation with a verbally competent CEO who knows how every machine in this factory works, this is the video for you. Great channel if you haven't found it yet. Easy to see why he's got 11 million subs. Guy knows what he's talking about and he is not afraid to say the hard truth that needs to be said, which is one more reason for us to like the guy. As an extra bonus, his grandfather was an engineer for the Apollo program. So not only did he grow up in this environment, he can provide some historical context. Destin's hour-long keynote speech to this crowd was a funny, informative, and grounded take on the current Artemis program, with special emphasis on the differences between the Starship HLS paradigm compared to the Apollo era missions. We've cut the hour-long talk down to a matter of minutes while trying to hit all the high points, but please go to his channel later and check out the presentation in full. For now, here are the thoughts he had that we think need to be discussed at all levels of NASA right now. And as he goes along, we'll slip in some comments along the way. Right out of the gate, he's going to address what he already knows is an issue with communication in this room. And he wastes no time breaking that ice. So my assumption here is that I'm talking to a room full of policymakers, intelligent people that are gonna shape the, fume, the, the future of human spaceflight. Is that correct? Somebody talk to me. Engineers, program managers, we as a society have lost the ability to provide negative feedback to each other. Because why? So this is the thing. You're terrified to talk right now, and that's a problem. You know the truth, and you're afraid to say it. Young engineers on the front row, what is this? PID control loop. What's an important part of the PID control loop? Feedback. Feedback is important to any engineer. If you have only positive feedback in the system, what happens to it? It goes unstable and chaotic and things explode and break and it's bad. So Destin has already determined the people in this room are timid when asked a simple question. And he's going to show them why that's an issue as the talk goes on. But if it's this bad at NASA, you can only imagine what it would be like at SpaceX, where Musk fires anybody who questions him or his instructions, a behavior he's famous for throughout the companies that he is supposed to lead. How can an environment of pure intimidation possibly result in a team effort that will build the system they need to conduct this mission, especially when the people who are bright enough to see the issues are then summarily escorted out of the building? We're going, right? I've seen the video. We are going. But there's this thing, there's a scoreboard that exists and the scoreboard looks like this. Apollo era engineers, six lunar landings, Artemis, zero. This. So they did it, right? Let's look at how they did it. So this is the mission for Apollo. Left Earth, went out to LLO, went down, ascent stage, come back up, some rendezvous action in there, come home, right? Here's Artemis three. Let's look at this. Remember the part about saying the truth earlier? What do you guys think about this? It's different. Why is it different? So then I started trying to understand the architecture to get there. To get the human lander to the moon, we have to launch a bunch of additional rockets to tank up in low earth orbit. I didn't know that. And I'm like, well, how many rockets do we have to do that with? And they're like, six? Dude, really, how many rockets is it? Some people are like, well, it's looking like eight. We have to fire eight rockets to fire one rocket to the moon? I mean, that's what they're saying, but it's probably more like 12. You know, I'm an engineer, I know how to do this stuff. So I started to account for nominal schedule slip and boil off, and this is how many rockets it's gonna take <laughs> to fuel up that thing to get it to the moon. So the question is, is this smart? 
And now's the time where people are scared to talk again. Not efficient, it's not efficient. I picked a picture from the We Are Going video. That's how many rockets went to the moon and landed for, for all of Apollo. And I'll take you back to this chart. Okay, I've said enough. People in the audience did not know the number of rockets that were going to be used to refuel the lander. That's a problem. When I said 12 rockets the way I did, they laughed. It's probably more like 12. People didn't know the answer to this question. This is indicative of a communication problem. The fact that we have this very complex architecture and we don't know the exact answer to such a big question is pretty damning because if we don't know such a simple answer to a big question, what does that say about the little things? Destin is absolutely right here. How can NASA even begin to start working on a mission architecture or timetable when they don't know how many tanker launches it's going to take? If you don't know how many launches you need, you can't have any concept as to how long the vehicle will be loitering in orbit, what boil off will be, what supplies are going to be required for any crew that may be aboard. What if the refilling process takes weeks or months longer to conduct? What's the contingency plan if one or more of the ships doesn't make it to orbit? What additional logistics are then involved? Nobody knows these answers because they can't know these answers until this critical number is finalized. This is indicative of a horrible lack of communication between the contractor, SpaceX, and the client, NASA. And it's an issue plaguing Jim Free right now who is getting no answers from SpaceX with regards to realization of benchmarks. SpaceX is on contract to do an uncrewed lander. Our milestone before that is the ship-to-ship -ship cryogenic propellant transfer. We're delaying our CDR until they complete that. Then they have to just get flying. That's a lot of launches to get those missions done. We have a firm fixed price contract with SpaceX. Their job is to deliver that to us and I'm gonna hold them accountable to it. So they need to get flying before we can get any kind of assessment. If you figure they need a number of launches to do their depot for our crew flight, they need a number of launches to do the demo. They need a number of launches just to get flying. They have a significant number of launches to go. That of course gives me concern about the December of 2025 date. Does that sound like NASA is being fully apprised of every action being taken by SpaceX to achieve their goal? Or does it sound like NASA is operating on a wing and a prayer right now, hoping that SpaceX can hit any of these milestones in the near future? After the second Starship launch disaster, Jim Free put out this tweet, which if you read the context here, is basically asking SpaceX, what did you learn from this launch that will help you move forward? Since the vehicle didn't make orbit, no booster recovery was attempted, and the mission failed twice due to LOV. We can tell you one thing that they did learn from that launch. They learned that it can take their telemetry technicians over three minutes to realize the ship has exploded and is tumbling through the sky over Key West. In light of these failed launches, Jim's only recourse now seems to be withholding future payments until the propellant transfer demo is completed successfully. But that's really not much of a penalty at the end of the day, because SpaceX, as we found out, had already collected billions towards this contract before Kathy Leaders ever left NASA. Going back to the Smarter Everyday video, Destin now launches into an Apollo flashback from his grandfather's time around NASA for a direct comparison. When my grandfather was sipping coffee out of this mug down the road, they had quarterly reports on every little component of what was going on, down to the pressure transducers at some subcontractor at a small plant somewhere in America. They knew what was going to happen because the more complex a system is, the more communication you need to make it work. Saturn V quarterly film report number seven. Saturn V quarterly film report number nine. We are two years out from this launch and we don't know the number of rockets. It's time to be honest. It is time to lay out and systematize the communication so that every organization that's involved knows far more information than they need and we have actual targets and dates that are actionable and they don't depend on a miracle in technological innovation occurring and at some point on the Gantt chart, we actually have actionable things that have to happen in certain time frames. And if something doesn't happen, a critical technology isn't developed, we communicate that there's a schedule slip to everyone. The fact that it still says two years till this launch tells me that we have a communication issue and I would like for that to be resolved by centralized leadership. There, I said my thing. Now to update this information, since the release of his video, the GAO and NASA realized in December that two years out is not a feasible time frame. 
Maybe this dressing down from Destin in October of 2023 played a part in that, and hopefully this next segment hit home for the people in the room as well. If I'm not mistaken, this room is full of people that are industry leaders that are in charge of taking humans back to the moon. Answer the following question. Have I read NASA SP-287? And if you have not read it, shame on you. You have a whole generation of engineers that did the coolest thing engineering humans have ever done, and they gave you the playbook. And they're like, hey, this is how you do it. This is the key. It's a lot of really good stuff, but let's just read some of them. Of course, the way we got this job done was with meetings. Big meetings, little meetings, hundreds of meetings. The thing we always tried to do in these meetings was to encourage everyone, no matter how shy, to speak out, hopefully, but not always, without being subjected to ridicule. We wanted to make sure we had not overlooked any legitimate input. It seems like they might have had a little different culture. In a room full of experts and engineers, Destin is reminding them the only stupid question is the question never asked, and that when the first moon landing program was being developed, every question was encouraged. And that's how they wound up creating a system that not only worked, but was also loaded with redundancies and contingency plans, which is why when the Apollo engineers were building their craft, their motto was keep it simple. All right, so spacecraft design, I thought this was interesting. This is the key to how to build your spacecraft. Build it simple and then double up on as many components or systems so that if one fails, the other will take over. Examples are ablative thrust chambers that don't require regenerative cooling, hypergolic propellants that don't require ignition source. I was kind of blown away to learn that the ascent stage in the current design does not use hypergolic propellants. That blew my mind. So we're going up there. We got to ignite this. I get it. You want to use in situ and you want to do methane. I got it. But hypergols always work. You make them touch and they go boom. That's how it works. Why are we introducing complexity into a system? Then I looked at Artemis three. In order for this to work, like it starts, humans have never done cryogenic refueling in orbit up to this point right now. And I think it's important for you guys to talk about this with authority because you're smart and you know things. We should make it as simple as possible. Destin is now making direct comparisons of the complexity of Artemis against the simplicity of Apollo the hypergolic propellants versus the methane rockets SpaceX intends to use reflects a chasm of design philosophy between the two designs. And Destin is about to get into another example of how much thought went into the Apollo craft and the situations it might encounter. Have you ever looked at how they decided to get the lunar lander off the moon, the ascent stage? It's crazy because it's awesome. So we're gonna get the timing right and we're gonna launch. That doesn't work because things aren't whatevering. Here's what we're gonna do. If all else fails, open the hatch, go around the back. And so there's these guillotines that connect the descent and the ascent stage. And you had to flip a switch and it would cut the guillotines, right? If that didn't work for whatever reason, you're gonna get out of the spacecraft, you're gonna go to the bottom of the spacecraft with bolt cutters, and you're going to cut the straps that are holding the ascent and the descent stage together. They had redundancy after redundancy after redundancy after redundancy, all the way down to the bolt cutters, and Harrison Schmidt said there was one thing after this. I just wanna know what that was. Are we building that level of redundancy into today's systems? Go look at the documents, this is a real thing. All right, so. <laughs> of course, every engineer in the room knows for a fact that the level of simplicity and redundancy attained by their predecessors is not represented in the image of Starship sitting on a landing pad that magically appeared at Moon Base Alpha, which apparently is an actual diagram in the SpaceX filings. And speaking of landing pads, that takes us to one of the most critical redundancies necessary in a space vehicle, where in the event something goes wrong, and the crew needs to override the automatic flight plan that the crew has not only the ability, but also the training required to take over control of the ship. Dustin covers this topic as well, but first we're going to take another excerpt from the NSF interview for how the actual leads at NASA are preparing for this. The ability to manually take control of the lander. Um, so, you know, you've got the, the automated guidance system, but we saw what happened with Apollo 11 with Neil Armstrong, right? He's miles off course and has to actually manually control himself around uh, to find a good place to land. What are ways that, you know, they've been able to, to pivot with that to make sure that they're gonna be safe on uh, that HLS system? So we're still at the um, the stage of development where we're working through those topics. From a requirement standpoint, what we did is we uh, wrote requirements that the lander both 
has to be fully autonomous um, and that the crew has to be able to intervene and take over manual control. Uh, as the design gets further along, what we'll end up doing is spending a lot of time with the crew in uh, simulators and going through different manual control algorithms um, and testing different lighting conditions and environments and vehicle response rates um, to be able to get to a point where it is a really is a vehicle that can both be autonomous but able to be operated by the crew in case something something takes over. Okay, so to get the astronauts trained up for landing on the moon in one six gravity, their plan is to run simulation after simulation with different conditions in play. But none of that is up and running yet because they are still in the development stage creating that redundant system. Now listen to what Destin has to say about what crew training should look like, along with a man who helped design the Apollo LLTV lunar landing training vehicle, and another man who flew it. Crew training is paramount. The lunar lander test vehicle, for example, if you're gonna land in a 1 6th G environment, you have to know how to do that. Our pilots are used to walking around in 1 G. Well, this is how they trained astronauts to land on the moon. The reason this is more important than a simulator is the astronaut in the seat, their life is on the line. That psychological training has a huge component. Mr. Ottinger, who worked on the control system, and I asked him a very important question. Do you think something like the LLTV needs to happen to train astronauts to go back to the moon? They aren't gonna go if they don't get a trainer, a free flight trainer, I can tell you that. Really? Yeah, they won't go without it. I hope that the person at the controls has a simulation experience that is at least as good as the LLTV provided the Apollo crews a half century later. Thank you. After showing his audience in no uncertain terms, the difference between what was then and what is now, in the voice of one of their own from the Apollo era, and a man whose life was saved by the training he went through, Destin is going to remind them again of the primary responsibility an engineer has, regardless of the roadblocks they face. As the engineer is responsible for getting humans to the moon safely and returning them, it is imperative that you provide negative feedback in situations that call for it. If you lose your job for providing negative feedback, Good on you. If it needed to be said and nobody said it, that would be the worst thing to live with. Don't compromise on your standards. Let me tell you what's gonna happen. You're gonna get in that room and you're gonna tell them we can't do this and we can't do this because of that. And they're gonna say, but my schedule, you just have to be willing to say the truth. You mitigate the risk as far as you can. You communicate clearly, but you make sure you don't compromise on standards. It's time to put points on the board and they've given you the playbook, SP-287. Look at the mission differently. Keep it simple, right? In a world of talkers, be a thinker and a doer. Be willing to take action in the meetings to make the hard decisions and ask the hard questions. We do not need to have an Apollo 1 type event in order to get us in gear. Don't get fixated on a technology demonstration. Just because we can do something new and sexy and awesome and amazing and wild doesn't mean you have to. Simple is good. And so as long as it accomplishes the mission. So be mission focused. And, and I, I think things are gonna be okay. Destin ended off on a gentle note, but the presentation was obviously geared at sending these engineers and department heads home with food for thought about where the program stands and what needs to be done to save it. He also showed them exactly where to find that information. SP-287 is the roadmap to get to the moon. Part of their thought process moving forward will no doubt include the question, how did NASA get sucked into allowing a contractor to change absolutely everything about a system that successfully flew men to the moon decades ago? How did the keep it simple motto get tossed out the window? Why is the entire Artemis III mission reliant upon untested technology breakthroughs that need to be provided by a company with a part-time CEO who would much rather sit on his phone all day and curse out his social media advertisers in public? And this is the degree to which Keep It Simple has been dismissed as SpaceX fails to deliver for NASA. On February 1st, 2024, NASA published their 2023 annual wrap-up report. Heading number four, section B, deals with Artemis progress and challenges. We'll quote it directly in full, the degree to which Artemis concerns the panel that published this document due to the aggressive launch timeline combined with the number of firsts that must be accomplished to achieve Artemis III objectives, many of which must be performed sequentially in a fully successful manner, even before its launch. 
The following is a partial list of the first either attempted as a demonstration before the Artemis 3 mission or attempted on the Artemis 3 mission itself. A. First mission dependent on the human landing system requiring approximately 15 fueling launches to support Artemis 3. B. First launch of the new Orion variant. C. First use of the HLS LEO depot station, including cryo refueling. And we're just going to point out that NASA is using the term refueling. So if any muskrat gives you shit for using refueling instead of the term refilling, tell them to pound sand. If you know, you know. D. First HLS launch from Cape Canaveral on a new launch pad. E. First HLS lander Orion rendezvous and docking in lunar orbit. F. First HLS uncrewed lunar landing. G. First HLS uncrewed demonstration of a successful lunar ascent. H. First HLS crewed landing on the moon. I. First lunar extravehicular activity EVA since 1972. J. First use of the new EVA suits. K. First HLS crewed ascent from lunar surface to lunar orbit. L. First use of lunar surface communication and broadly integrated communication system. M. First landing at the challenging South Pole site. These points refer to the Starship HLS. As yet, there is no comparable evaluation of Artemis V, including the Blue Origin craft. So take all of that into consideration, along with the fact that according to court documents, the original contract that Musk agreed to was supposed to launch for the moon last month, January 2024, with the mission preliminary design review due way back in July of 2022, and the mission critical design review due a year ago. And you get some idea how foobard Artemis 3 is at this point in time. We said at the time the solo HLS contract was awarded to SpaceX by the same person heading up that program now in Boca Chica that the mistake of awarding Musk that contract was going to cost North Americans the moon. And we have yet to be proven wrong on that prediction. When the strongest critiques exposing the most basic flaws in this program were coming from YouTubers such as CSS and Thunderfoot, then there is a more serious core issue happening at NASA. And Destin nailed it. During the Apollo program, Every aspect of the program was managed, scheduled, benchmarked, the smallest details reviewed repeatedly, the steps laid out for all to see. Now, under the private contractor arrangement that NASA has with Musk, they have none of the above. According to his recent public statements, Jim Free has no certainty about any aspect of Starship, not regarding refilling technology, not regarding the demo mission, not even regarding the basics of Starship reliability and safety. Hell, they don't even know where this is going to launch from, and nobody wanted this vehicle anywhere near the infrastructure assets at Kennedy before both IFT-1 and 2 ended in disaster. And Musk's iterative design process for this vehicle is an obvious abject failure. So what does NASA have in Starship compared to what they know worked? They've got a completely different vehicle, made from completely different materials, using completely different engines, using a different propellant mix, using refilling technology that was not required before, and a completely different mission architecture. There are no commonalities between this and what got men to the moon 50 years ago. But thankfully, SpaceX is no longer the only private rocket company with a lunar landing contract, and relying on a completely different mindset at Blue Origin might just get the Artemis program back on track, with a system that more closely mimics the original successful formula that already has a lander concept fully fleshed out that NASA can walk through and customize, that has a suitable rocket with new proven engines scheduled to fly later this year to Mars, five years ahead of their scheduled lunar duty, and rather than trying to get a 23-story stainless steel cigar tube to land on its butt in loose lunar regolith, Blue Moon will be smaller, squatter, with the astronauts closer to the ground which can be accessed by ladder, much more in line with the vehicles NASA used in the past being built by a company moving forward step by step with intent and ferocity, without false promises promoted by an army of idiots. In fact, Blue Origin moves forward in spite of the muskrats. So there's a chance Blue Origin can get Artemis back on the rails. And if that's the case, where Blue Origin is ready to go before Musk can get his ducks in a row, there's every possibility that Artemis 5 could fly before Artemis 3. And here's why we think so. In August of 2023, NASA had an Artemis update conference. Now keep in mind this was before the GAO announcement of delays and the 2023 year-end report. The question for Jim Free 
came from Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. What's your working target date for Artemis 3? Is it still late 25? For Artemis 3, we're still working to our contractual dates with everyone, which is the December of 25. Uh, we did receive a up, updated schedule from SpaceX that we're, uh, we're looking to uh, get some more detail on. We were at Starbase uh, a couple weeks ago and really spent some time going through their major milestones uh, to uh, the Artemis 3 mission, which includes a prop transfer mission, as well as the uncrewed demo. Uh, so really kind of sharing our philosophy, their philosophy, where they are with the hardware, trying to understand their schedule some more. So I think we're, we're, we'll look at that and update around that in the, in the near future after we have some time to digest it. But what we're holding all the contractors to is that December of 25 date. We may end up, you know, flying a different mission if that's the case. You know, if, if we have these big slips out, we've looked at can we can we do other missions if the if the possibility exists there. Given the current state of the Starship program, Jim Free would be remiss as administrator of this program to not offer the first Artemis moon landing to the first company past the post. Because at the end of the day, the Tortoise may well be the only private rocket company in the running that can get NASA astronauts back on lunar soil safely. At the time of this conference, Jim Free was hoping to hold Musk to a December 2025 timetable. Well, according to a Musk tweet from February 9th of 2024, Musk is saying he thinks Starship should be able to get to the moon in five years. Not 2025, not 2026, not 2027, but bumping up against the Blue Origin timetable for Artemis 5 in 2029. But before we sign off, there's something that's been bugging us all the way along about the paradigm for SpaceX HLS, because it's actually quite illogical, even if the stars align and SpaceX gets it to work as promised. In the con ops for Artemis 3, in theory, the progression is Starship gets to LEO, gets refilled with propellants, shoots off for the moon. It is not carrying personnel at this point. That crew will be launched separately on SLS, traveling to the moon in the Orion capsule. The two craft rendezvous in NRHO, a highly elliptical three-body orbit with a one-week interval. Personnel move from Orion to Starship, Starship lands on the moon, stays the intended time, and ascends back to orbit. Another rendezvous in NRHO, personnel embark Orion and head back to Earth. So then what? The entire premise of Artemis is that the HLS vehicles are reusable, like an elevator to and from the surface to be used over and over again and acting as the hab while astronauts are on the moon. Well, if this thing is supposed to be getting reused, how is it getting refilled? How is it getting resupplied? How is it getting repaired? If another Orion capsule comes from Earth with a crew, they're going to have to bring all the supplies they need for their mission in the capsule, which makes Starship seem pointless. Why the need for a giant structure to move back and forth from the surface to orbit if everything the astronauts need can fit in the capsule? And can that capsule hold 1,200 tons of propellant to refill the Starship? Guessing not, or it would have to be the size of the Starship tanks. And if Starship is not going to be reused in this manner, the Starship HLS makes even less sense. Since it can't return to Earth for reuse because it can't survive a descent through the atmosphere. This really demonstrates how the Starship lander has not been fully thought through. Blue Moon, on the other hand, has a completely different SOP. It too will require refilling, but certainly not 1,200 tons worth of propellant, as the craft is far smaller than Starship. It will be refilled in NRHO, because in the con ops for Artemis V, there is a cis lunar transporter designed by Lockheed Martin that will be refilled in LEO, then shipped off to NRHO to meet the lander before it docks at Gateway a joint effort between NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, JAXA, and ESA. In NRHO, crew arriving at Gateway in the Orion capsule will transfer into the lander, drop to the surface, do their mission, come back up, then they hop into Orion for their trip back to Earth. But in this case, the lander and the transporter are now ready for another mission. When the lander needs to be resupplied or refilled, there is already a logistical vehicle accounted for in their system for the next mission. This system would appear to be a lot more logical, provided that Blue Origin and their partners can work out their on-orbit refilling system in that time frame, something no company nor agency has managed to pull off yet, and something we've given SpaceX a fair amount of grief about. 
After all, SpaceX was awarded a $53 million bonus contract in 2020 just to prove their orbital refilling program, and so far they have nothing to show for it. Now the one thing we don't like is that the original concept lander the national team provided had an ascent stage that would launch from the surface of the moon from the descent stage it left behind. It split in half, just like on Apollo. Two different sets of engines because landing in the loose regolith of the moon is sure to damage the engines firing into it. That's why that feature was incorporated into the original design. But because the requirements of the mission now are for the craft to be completely reusable, like an elevator, the entire craft has to launch as it landed, and that means won't have separated ascent and descent engines. To punctuate that point, Apollo 15 is a historical precedent where a hard landing on the edge of a crater resulted in the descent stage engine bell getting buried in the regolith. Eight feet minus one, contact, man. Okay, Houston, the Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. No denying that, we had contact. The craft suffered damage on the underside. Had the ascent stage not been up and out of harm's way, those astronauts would have all died on the moon. So how they're going to mitigate that aspect of the lander will be something to keep an eye on. Being a smaller craft, of course, it should be much easier to kick off the surface than the behemoth Starship, but firing into the regolith each time gives us pause for concern. All things considered, given the progress of the two competitors, the designs they're working on, the concept of operations they're working within, and the respective dedication to the mission from the company CEOs, our money is on the tortoise, making it to the moon first. And if that happens, who's going to have the blue balls then? As we thank you for tuning into this series from the Common Sense Skeptic, we leave you with a highlight reel of Artemis 1, the only vehicles to fly to date in the Artemis program. A perfect mission for SLS and Orion on their very first time out. It's been a marathon and we learned a lot, so hopefully you have as well from this two hour production. As much as we covered, there will always be items that can be discussed further. And that's what the comments section is for. Be sure to leave any questions you have that were left unanswered, and maybe we'll do a follow-up to address them. If you would like to directly support future Common Sense Skeptic episodes and multi-part series, you can subscribe to our Patreon, or for a one-time donation, find our GoFundMe page. It also helps the channel a great deal if you give the episode a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Also, make sure you're subscribed and ring that notification bell so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns. <laughs>